Hello, everybody, and welcome to a midweek masterclass with Tony Harmer today, everybody, for 90 minutes of smart objects and raw camera action fun. Um, I think raw everyone needs to fasten their, <laughs> they need to fasten their seatbelts today, Tony, right? Because there's a lot we're going to be covering. There is, mainly our faces while we're laughing so much. <laughs> Always. I I thought, oh, dude, this is going to be so much fun today when Emma said, uh, you know, that we'd be together to do a masterclass. Um, hey to everyone in the chat. I saw that, um, I think it was Jackie mentioned that they've been tuning in for 10 months of Adobe Live. And we're so wow. glad that you're tuning in. It's so good to have this community and see everybody. I can see Stuart, I can see Gareth, Robert, Andreas. Uh, Pradmit, I can see Kirsty as well. Um, it's so good to see you all. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we can definitely promise you laughs today, as every time Tony and I get together, we, I mean, we end, one of us ends up crying with tears, normally me. <laughs> but I promise not to burn any bright colours into your screens today, as it will not be me that's creating anything or drawing anything in Photoshop. So. <laughs> So normally tons of laughter whenever we are together it's true and it's great yes, it is. tons it's of really laughter great. yeah and yeah. normally ending up falling asleep on something <laughs> <laughs> do you remember oh. we did that we did that once we fell asleep on each other's shoulders while we were talking in vegas, in vegas. yes yes because uh, it was it was one of those nights where everybody was out and uh, we were at machines and and you know when you're just like putting the money in the <laughs> oh man that was we, did. we just dropped off that was funny How very funny, funny. <laughs> it was funny well it's so, yeah. oh Stuart's here ppe at the re ppe ready and angus says i wouldn't miss this one yes anger <laughs> there we go angus there. yeah such great people we've got on here it's fabulous isn't it really good i know and robert says no bright colors no only other than what i'm wearing your jumper I've decided, I was saying to Tony to wear high vis to keep the kids away from me. It's like a warning of stay away from, from me today, please. So, um, yes, that, that is why. <laughs> Good. Do you know, I've just noticed how massive my beard's getting. That needs a cut. I just, <laughs> I'm just look at that, it's super thick. I'm no. like Santa. Oh, Lord. <laughs> anyway, right, moving on. <laughs> so then. today. Yeah, I know. Mainly Photoshop. There is a little bit of Illustrator in it. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh -huh. Tiny little bit. Cool. Um, so, I suppose you want to know what I'm doing, right? Uh, that's going to be the main thing. So, uh, I am going to be uh, doing a lot around smart objects, different things connected to smart objects. Um, first of all, because I'm always surprised at how many people actually still, and these have existed since, uh, I think it's 2001. 2002 so like uh -huh. 19 years um and there are still people who who don't know about them don't know what they do how to make them why they should make them uh, and all of that stuff so we'll start all of that and there's various different things uh that we can cover uh around smart objects but we'll do a few other things as well so it's not like super dry and here's the here's mm. the thing we'll do some proper like master class stuff some clever stuff Good. Um, and Smart well. Objects um, was one of the first things that you taught me, actually, back in mm. 2016, as I was creating um, a training guide for people yeah. to learn about Photoshop in like five steps or learn activities. And um, we made a really cool um, kind of layout. And you, you taught me about Smart Objects back then. So it's good yeah. to see. And I'm sure I'm not using them in the way I should be still to this day. So it's good to, um, you know, to see. No, I'm sure you are. Well, the thing is, people do miss, people do miss little bits to do with them, and that they are very, very useful. So, essentially, I suppose I ought to cover what a smart object is, and probably the easiest way 
uh, for me to start that is here in a file. I've just got a file of a bridge that I'm going to be using uh, later on. And actually, this is content that I've pasted in uh, to this new document just here. OK, and what I'm going to do is turn that into a smart object. All right. So there's a few different ways you can do that. Um, you, as with Photoshop, there's normally like 16 different ways to do the same thing at different points in the interface. Uh, but one of the easiest ways is to right click uh, on a layer in the layers panel and choose this option here, uh, convert to smart object, right? You can also do it from the layers menu and a smart object is created. Now, the only way you would know that is because there's a small icon down at the bottom there and it shows sort of a linked document. It's not actually a linked document because the file still lives inside of this document. So just so you have an idea right, of where this is going, let me just go ahead and drop us down into uh, a folder here. I've created a folder called Smarty Pants. It's a good name for a folder, I think. And I saved that as a PSD uh, as screenshot, bizarrely, uh, just there. What on earth went on there? Let me just undo that. There we go. We'll try that again. So I'll do save as uh, into Smarty Pants, and we'll just call this original. It's there. Laxo. Okay. Good. All done. So we've got that file, original. But if I go ahead now and double click on this thumbnail in the layers panel, you'll notice, hopefully, right, that it looks similar, but you can see there's just layer one in here. And this file is actually called layer1.psb. Do you know what PSB stands for, Mads? Oh, uh, Photoshop something. Go on. <laughs> um, Bridge? I don't know. Um, I don't know what the B is. It's Photoshop big. big. Straight oh, right. up. Yeah, that's what it is. Photoshop big because it's the large and uh, extraneous file format uh, that Adobe uses for things. So you can process like super massive documents using the PSB format um, in there. So and other things and it can wrap other things up. So here I am inside of that file. OK, and I can switch backwards. So if I close back out of this. Here I am back in the layers of the original. So that's the first thing of a smart object. You can use it to kind of protect content. Now, where, the, where that's very, very useful is imagine if uh, you wanted to work in RGB, right? Because you've got more latitude to work in RGB, right? But you, uh, you had to deliver a CMYK document, but you wanted to keep going backwards and forwards. Yeah, so what I could do here is go ahead to this image i'm going to change the mode here to cmyk i am not going to flatten it okay and i'm also not going to rasterize a smart object and then i'm going to convert the file okay so if i were to supply this file anywhere or use this file inside of a document yeah it would to all intents and purposes be a cmyk document you can see up here in uh, the document bar there cmyk eight bits per channel there. Whereas if I go back to the thumbnail and double click, I've got an RGB document there. OK, so that's RGB, 8 bits per channel, uh, just there as well. Right. So I've got all of the latitude that Photoshop can give me right inside of this document. Right. But here, CMYK for output. Now, that does mean if I did some wacky stuff inside of this, so I'm going to add uh, a gradient map here just for giggles right? with um, Actually, I've added a gradient overlay, but that's that's fine. And if I just choose to overlay that, so some of those colours are going to be too bright to reproduce in CMYK. They're not quite Maddie level colours, yeah, <laughs> but you know they're heading that way. They are. They are indeed. Definitely, <laughs> definitely going that way. Now, if I change here to the gamut warning, which shows me that out of gamut colours, right? So colours that can't be achieved. Uh, in CMYK, you can, they're represented here by these grey bands and these small bits here. That just means they're going to be changed when they get to CMYK. Okay, so if I switch back out of that, okay, so here we go, turn the gamut warning off. There we are. Okay, and save this because I need to save it because it's a file within a file, still another file, and go back to this one. You can see that it's now modeled down all of those colors. If I go back to the gamut warning, there's no gray there at all because it's modified the colors into the space of That's this clever. document. Okay, it's good, isn't it? 
Mm. So that's one way you could work between uh, those things. That gradient, however, is horrendous. So, <laughs> so I've just duplicated it by accident. Super good. Oh, there we go. Trash can. Thank you very much. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of creating a smart object is by using a keyboard shortcut, because if it's the sort of thing you do all the time, yeah, what you could do, okay, is go to your edit menu, go down to your keyboard shortcuts, all right, and then create a shortcut for it. So if I went here to the application menus and then went through to the, uh, I think it's in layer actually, so let's just have a look from in here. But anyway, you'd find that shortcut and then assign it in here. You'd need to create yourself a new set, right? But you could do that. The shortcut I use for mine, let me just quickly see where that is. I think it is in layer, you know. Yeah, smart objects convert to smart object. You can see here, I've assigned option command S to mine, alt control S to mine. And the reason I've assigned that is because by default, Photoshop gives two shortcuts to save as, yeah? So it gives shift command S or shift control S, and it also gives option command S or option control S to, or alt control S rather, to windows. How many save as shortcuts do you actually need? That's true. So, you know, choose the one that you're gonna use and assign the other one to creating a smart object. So that's another way uh, to and Tony, actually um... Yeah. Uh, Jan asks a question in the chat. Uh, does this also work for lab color or LAB color? Uh, LAB is the intermediary space uh, for many color operations inside of Photoshop. But what I'll do is just for your uh, entertainment, I'm going to get rid of that gradient layer because I didn't do it permanently. I will go ahead and change the mode to LAB. OK, so now that's an LAB uh, color document just there. If I save it and go back into the CMYK document. There you go. Yeah. So LAB is super, super useful for lots and lots of different things. Um, but yeah, it's used as a space in the middle of actually the conversions that happen between RGB and CMYK anyway. So going into that space won't hurt. In fact, lab is the one color space you can work in that's not going to be affected by any uh, changes uh, really inside of other documents. It's, it's a good space to be in cool. for that. So don't get too many people working it, however, because it's not as straightforward as um, as some of the other spaces. In fact, what I'm going to do is mm -hmm. I'm just going to find up here. Um, just give me a second. I'm going to bring in an image of uh, a canyon, something I've got on my own machine. Yeah. Uh, quite well, a lot of, but. Yeah, go on. While you while you do that, Catherine says um, that Catherine used to use Lab to stop bleeding on images um, back in the day. Back in the day. Well, I mean, it's it it you had you've there's something very technical um, about working in LAB, and we're going to look at that in just a second. Uh, actually, I'm just trying to find you very quickly an image. This will do, I think. Uh, so let me just get you a file here and open that up. Just hold on a second. Oh, it's not quite here yet. Here we go. So, give me a second for it to come through. All right, still downloading. Let me show you what the LAB space uh, contains, right? So in the LAB space, because technically you shouldn't call it lab, there are people who would be really offended by, by you calling it lab. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you don't call you don't call RGB Rugaber, do you? You don't call CMYK some yik. <laughs> I see. Wait, yeah. I, it's I because they have a specific meaning: red, green, and blue. So I am magenta, yellow, and key. Yeah. LAB okay. is lightness, A channel, and B channel. Yeah. So it's very, very different. So in LAB, the luminosity or the lightness is the primary thing that works in there. And then you've got two channels. You've got the A channel, which I th I'm trying to remember my channels the right way around. I think it's actually yellow to blue in the A channel. And then you've got magenta to green in the B channel. Okay, so that you can see they're very, very different, right? They're yeah. completely different color components. Mm -hmm. And like a, like a lot of color models, this, this model's three dimensional. 
but it takes a bit of getting used to. If I just go ahead and open this uh, canyon image, and in fact, I'm only going to use a portion wow. of that image here. Okay, that so it's not one of mine. This one's from Adobe Stock. All of the stuff I'm using today is from Adobe Stock. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut a chunk of that out. Whoops, a daisy. So let's grab this bit just here. Okay, and copy that. Close that. New document. Do that. Drop that in. And then zoom in a bit here. So canyons are actually uh, a real problem for people who are photographing. In fact, there's a book on that, which I actually have up here on the top shelf. If you want to find out more about colour, this is, as far as I know, the only book on that topic. Wow. Yeah. The Canyon Conundrum and Other Adventures in the Most Powerful Colour Space. So if you really, really want to tear it up with colour, and of course, Maz, I'm speaking to the right person. You are. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need a book on how to tone it down. How to... Yeah. <laughs> In the I describe field. you as a colour terrorist. In, in that. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, it's a, it's a real, the struggle is real. <laughs> anyway, it is, it is a real problem to extract some of those colours and to balance them out. So mm. uh, if I make sure I've got an RGB image, so I'm just going to convert this one back. Also, normally conversion between spaces, conversion between RGB and CMYK, there's some destruction that occurs in that particular process. Right. Mm. Whereas LAB is neutral, so you can drop it into, you know, the, no, it doesn't damage anything when it's converted either in mm. or out from that. So that's why it's such a good space. And that's why it's used as an intermediary space. Uh, so I've just converted this one to RGB. OK, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a curves adjustment on here. OK, and then just give you a bit more room to see it. So. With the curves adjustment here, this is working across three channels and we can see all three channels here, red, green and blue. So if we had a color bias, we could go ahead, for example, and change uh, the values in that particular channel. Mm. Right, you see that? So I'm increasing the amount of green, yeah. decreasing the amount of green. I'm not trying to perform an actual adjustment here just to illustrate it. Right. So that's what we've got uh, with uh, those things. Let me just delete uh, that layer just there and yeah. go back into this one and I'm going to convert this to LAB like so because I'm a good person saying LAB <laughs> I'm a good person <laughs> so not <laughs> right so uh, don't flatten thank you very much now if I go to adjustments and add a curves adjustment here's the thing for the overall lightness in here I know we're a little bit away from the smart objects thing but that doesn't really matter it's all in context right yeah. And, uh, and Tim, has, Tim has helped you out in the chat. He said that A is for red and green and B is for yellow and blue. Is it? Mm -hmm. I can never remember. It's, I normally think of it as being the other way around to actually that's exactly right. And the, the way I normally remember it, but didn't this morning, is that when you're in Lightroom or in Camera Raw, which we will be later on, mm -hmm. the first one is normally temperature, which goes from cold, blue to hot, yellow. And so, and the second one is tint, which goes from magenta, uh, green to magenta. And it's the other way around in the lab space. Same yeah. things, but the opposite way around. So there is a relationship uh, between them. So here in this, this is the lightness channel. So anything I do here is only affecting the luminance of the image. It doesn't really have anything to do right, with the colors at all. But if I go to the channels, this is where it gets interesting. Because if you look at the A channel, rather than there being that histogram that goes across all of those 256 levels in the way that you're familiar with, here, they're very different. And you can see that all of the color information here is in the middle, yeah. yeah, because it's a thing around balance in that particular area. But if I brought this in uh, by a certain amount, in fact, I'm gonna use the grid lines just here. I need to bring in the same thing on the other edge. Yeah, so something like that. I'm going to do this to extremes here in the A channel and then in the B channel. Okay, if I can switch to the B channel. Oh, I was in the B channel. There we go. No, I wasn't. Okay, so if I bring in the B channel, you can actually start to see colours appear. That I mean, that, that's, that is Maddie level, that sort of level of saturation <laughs> uh, just there. But you get the idea, right? Yeah. Is that it's a very different space. And you can sometimes... 
Um, I've got a picture somewhere from the Anza Borrego Badlands, uh, a place with a very few, uh, very few uh, plants, but occasionally you do get them. And it just looks like a piece of red rock. But when you tune it by about 10% either end, you suddenly see these streaks of copper, but well, they're green uh, in the rock appearing, different sort of layers of deposit, wow. which is fantastic. And it brings out a whole other thing. Uh, and in fact, in that book, sample files from that book, there's uh, there's a, an image not entirely dissimilar. So there yeah. we go. And so anyway, that, that's gone. Gareth, uh, um, Gareth has mentioned in the chat, which is absolutely hilarious. Gareth's always great with the puns. And this could be a future stream with me in it. Um, <laughs> crimes against humanity. It is good, isn't it? <laughs> Very good. good. Yes, loving this. He is good. <laughs> I actually, oh, do you know what? Just another tangent. This is why I'm telling you the tangent, right? The um, another tangent. If you take a look, I don't know how often um, you go to uh, color.adobe.com. Yeah. Um, just hold on a second. Let me bring you a window in because I'll just show you something because there's been some developments there. Uh, with uh, color checking because CVD, which is the term uh, color vision deficiency, which is what most people call color blindness uh, here, right? There's some things now where you can actually check against color in the accessibility tools here, right? If you've got a particular color theme, it tells me that A, B, C and D are in conflict. That's because they're too similar in there and so i can move these around and then you'll see these related connectors okay between other colors you can move things around so there's more contrast can you see that i have so never helped, seen this before this is in new this is this is new actually yeah. so it's 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 new and then you can just go ahead and you can click on the individual things so it tells you which one you're working with just there it kind of highlights it just a little bit so you can make changes so that you're not going to make colorblind people see those colors, right? But you are going to enable them to see the contrast in it. And you can actually check it um, there. You can, so here's colorblind safe for this, but you can actually get it. So it shows you um, wow. things for protonopia and deuteronopia, which are the most common forms of red green uh, colorblindness. It doesn't do anything here for tritonopia, which is, the, which is super rare anyway. That's the people who've got virtually no color vision. Mm. Uh, at all but do check that out because i think that's a significant wow. development in there and it's a good thing to check your stuff for color blindness which of course you can do um in photoshop as well just uh just so you know seeing as we're talking talking maddy level color yeah <laughs> right if um if I, if I were to reintroduce i'm going to introduce a gradient map here this time which was my original uh intention so I'm going to go to the legacy gradients. I do wish I wouldn't call them that. But uh, anyway, let's, there you go. That's proper full on Mads predator style. Wow. <laughs> yes, it is um, predator style. It is it? predator style. It does look like a, like a thermal image. Yes. But the, um, <clears throat> pardon me. But uh, if I wanted to see how a color, how, you know, how the contrast would be for somebody with color blindness mm. yeah, or CVD, I could go to the view menu, come down to uh, proof setup, and you can see it's actually in here for protonopia and deuteronopia there. And it's in Illustrator and in Design as well, so you can check those things. So if I wanted to see how uh, someone with protonopia might see it, you can see they're actually going to lose quite a lot of information mm. in there. Yeah, Down here, there's not going to be enough contrast for them to be able to actually see what's, what's really in that image. Uh, and I can switch that to deuteronopia. Yeah, they look a little bit similar because they are related in the fact that they're both in the red green area of, of, of perception. But they are. So you've got that um, to use as well. So I know we, we went down a rabbit hole there, didn't we, for a minute? But <laughs> you know, there's sometimes, though, it's these little things that, you know, they spark up and you think, oh, I'm glad I've covered that. I'm glad I've seen that. Because it's things that we weren't planning on covering. But these are the things that actually, um, you know, we need to see. We need to. Yeah, super useful. That was useful. new for me, the colours. Never seen that before. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, so, smart, back to the smart objects thing. I'm going to use yeah. this one a bit later on, so I'll keep it in here and just drop uh -huh. uh, some other files into it. In fact, you know what? I'm going to create a new file. Anyway, let's go for... 
<sighs> Never got it the way I want it. I want to be able to shuffle those things around and put my things in there or have it learn priorities. Okay. But anyway, right. So uh, another way that smart objects are created, funny enough, is when you bring them in from Creative Cloud Libraries. So if I bring in something from a Creative Cloud Library, like this dolphin, for example, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to start laughing. There's a backstory to that, which unfortunately we're not going to be sharing. But if I bring this, <laughs> if I bring this dolphin in, you can see that it comes in as a smart object. And you might wonder why it does that and why that's useful. It's because Creative Cloud libraries are built for collaboration, right? So if you've got somebody who's putting the images into the library and then they need to make a modification to that asset, that library asset, then because everything using it is a smart object, then it will propagate down the chain like that. So if I go ahead here and uh, let's see if we can uh, select the subject just here. So we'll select subject using that fab algorithm. It's done a pretty good job it's so of selecting good, the dolphin. It is good, isn't it? Isn't it? I'm just going to switch to my brush tool here uh, and uh, get rid of uh, some stuff. So change my brush size. No, 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 and bring in a bit more of the dolphin, just like so. So it's got its belly. Do you know what? Last, no, not last year, uh, 2019, uh, no, 2018, when we went to Florida, and I hadn't been to that particular uh, Disney, uh, that particular park, uh, SeaWorld, uh, in. Uh, Discovery Cove, rather, in quite a long time, about oh. 20 years. And when I was there, I asked about um, Akai, the dolphin I met there, and he's still there. And they actually bought him from his enclosure into the into another pound where I could actually go and fuss him and give him a... Amazing. I wonder if you remember no that. Oh, yeah, I remember him. The guy They're very beard. clever, aren't they, dolphins? They're super cool. At one time, would have been on land, of course, wandering around. Uh, apparently, they were very much like wolves, so, so I believe uh, somebody told me a, a little while ago. Uh, so what I'm going to do then is jump that up onto another layer like so, and then I'll get rid of that. I'll get rid of the background. Yeah, And now I'm going to just crop this down. Da -da. Yeah, and... So is everybody enjoying this today? I don't. I need to ask you, Mads. Just let me know. Yeah. Well, you've got um, some people in the chat talking about dolphins, <laughs> um, about the dolphin story. You know? <laughs> um, and, yeah, just commenting on the wolves and uh, dolphins without fur. I mean, people are interested. Yeah. So I'm just going to call this one dolphin just here. Okay. In my Smarty Pants folder, it's a PSD file. And I'm then going to bring that file. Let me turn this layer off. Okay, so I'm going to go to the file menu here. I'm going to choose uh, Place Linked. Then I'm going to go for my Dolphin PSD. Okay, and there it is. Here's my Dolphin, like so. Okay, just there. Right. Now, if I go back to the Dolphin file, let's add a layer style to this. Let's add... Let's add a couple of strokes to it. Let's add a black stroke or blackish stroke, right, to the outside. And I'll make that seven pixels wide. So you can see it. Eight pixels wide is better. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll do that. And then, whoops, didn't mean to commit that. I'm then going to add another stroke here as well, which is going to be red because it's the most convenient one. And I'll add that one so that's just on the outside. So you can see I've got two strokes on there. Okay, that's another teaching point is that people don't realize that they can go ahead and add multiples of strokes, inner shadows, color overlays, gradient overlays, and drop shadows in the layer style dialog. Wherever you see that plus, it means yeah. you can have more than one and it's very, very useful. I use okay, that for so color overlays. That's the bit I use in there a lot. Yeah, this Surprise. one's nowhere near radioactive <laughs> enough. So let's put some, put some green on it. In fact, let's do that just now. Let's make this one. Let's go for a colour overlay. Uh, Maddie yeah, style. Well, of course I do. Of course I do colour overlays. Um, oh. so do it 
<laughs> yeah, we'll do that. We'll do colour overlay. Now, it's just a shame that I haven't got a preset that says radioactive. But we can we can, get to, <laughs> we can get to that. There we go. That's pretty radioactive, I think. Something that around that sort of region. Wow. There we are. Oh so radioactive God. dolphin, saving that, you going back to this document. Them. And, of course, it updates in there, right? So it makes sound sense <laughs> wow. to have that. Ah. <sighs> Such fun. <laughs> Radioactive <laughs> dolphin. Sandrine oh, in the chat is like, out of glow. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. We should. We should do that. Uh, let's make it uh, so it is... We don't, we'll Oliver, go normal. Meant, Oliver said in the chat that I should publish a colour swatch. <laughs> Yeah, I, you see, it's a mystery to me why they actually go to Pantone for the colour of the year because they're wasting their time. <laughs> to be honest, they could just, you know, go ahead, go straight to you, Mads. I, know. And, uh, I mean, seriously, I could pick colours. I mean, they'd be bright, but I could, I could do this as a service. <laughs> Bring that down somewhat. There we go. So wow. <laughs> there oh, we are. Yeah. So we've we've got that. <laughs> okay, and of course, in our CMYK space, because that's what this document is, mm. yeah, then it's not going to look anywhere near as uh, as violent uh, as it is uh, just there. But there you are. So yeah, <laughs> but the thing is, is that if the thing is, of course, if if that was somebody else who was contributing to that Creative Cloud library who was making the change, rather than me just making it on my own here yeah then yeah. it would just propagate throughout the whole system and there are a load of advantages to uh to doing that let me show you another thing i'm going to get rid of uh, this uh, layer here in fact i'm going to create just another new document uh, just for the minute and uh, let's pretend i was building some sort of i don't know brochure for something and just to just to kind of go through the motions a bit with this what i'm going to do is just introduce a box of text uh, just here, okay, and let's just change that size. Stapler accident finger, Tim's favourite um, shortcut of mine, by the way, or nickname, stapler accident finger. I put the top there to change that. Oh, God, it's an impact. What was I doing that? But anyway, never to mind. Right, so I've got something there, and actually thinking about it, let's have, let's fake something better. So there we are. Let's do a couple of different things here right so i've got that uh, i'm going to drag a copy of that down okay and just go into that and make some changes what i really like about photoshop you know mm -hmm. is that when you've got placeholder text in there it it has sort of a, an amount of placeholder text that it pops in mm. and if you just delete the front end, it's got more placeholder text behind it, which you'd have to make a bigger box in InDesign or yeah. Illustrator first to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of handy that it does it. Now we're going to build another new document. So uh, let's kind of work out what sort of size we've got to go with here. So I'm going to use a vector shape uh, to discover that. So in fact, I didn't really need to do that. Uh, let's go 400, 400. All right, so I can delete that did straight it, um away. I don't yeah. use shortcuts so much in Photoshop. Um, and I, so I create, um, as you know, like uh, posters and they've got a lot of text on them and all based in Photoshop. And what I find is that if I've got multiple text boxes and I need to edit the text inside them, if I click on the T for text, like the text tool on the left, mm. um, and I go to click in the box, sometimes I have to click out. Like I can't, it won't let me access every text box. So I might have to go to the move tool and then go back to the type tool, and then it will let me edit the box. Do you ever find that? Or is that uh, just thing that I've got? Yes and no. Yeah, I do sometimes. But the reason I don't ordinarily is because when I've got my move tool selected, yeah. I typically turn on auto select in the options bar at the top, Ooh. which can be both a blessing and a curse, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So I turn on auto select just there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then any... Uh, anything I click on, it becomes active. So you can see I can just click between those things yeah. and then I just double click on the T there inside the layers panel and it activates okay. it. Yeah. 
that could be a solution. But when you say about selecting the type tool on the left, you're actually meaning the tool itself, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, so you don't you don't actually need to do that. What you can do is just go across to the layers panel, yeah. double click on that T, and it does two things. It activates the text and also activates the text tool at the mm. same time, so it's ready for editing. And that's a better way to do it. That's good, because I have so many layers, so many layers of text. And so, aha, mm. uh -huh. all right. See, this is good yeah. to be live. And for anybody that's joined, by the way, um, we've been we're about 35 minutes into the stream now, and we're talking about... <gasps> Smart objects, um, and we, no. we do go off in a few different tangents with questions and things that come in. But um, yeah, we're ultimately talking about smart objects today. And we are. Yeah, any questions, get them in the chat. Yes, yes. Right, so I've got a couple of, two or three images here um, that I'm going to be using. Um, who knows what this is? <laughs> is that a, a flugelhorn? <laughs> it's a flugelhorn. It's a flugelhorn. <laughs> Oh dear. So I'm bringing in uh, some flugelhorns just here. I'm hoping they're all flugelhorns. I don't know. I keep joking about I'm going to buy one, but but I won't. Uh, that would be a good but, talent. You know, someone says, what's your, like, I, I guess like a party trick or something. Now you could be like, flugelhorn. Is do you know where the flugelhorn thing comes from? Where it, where um, it started? It wasn't at the movie with the Eurovision in Iceland. No. No, it actually came from Kyle Wilkinson. We had Kyle Wilkinson on the show. This is way back uh, last summer sometime. We had him on um, and he was talking about things where he where he slipped up and he, he was being interviewed on the radio and he jokingly mentioned about, you know, they said something like, what do you, I can't remember exactly the story, but it was something like, so what do you do at the weekend? Oh, I'm just practicing my flugelhorn. Yeah. <laughs> And the person who was interviewing him on the radio only turned out to be like a super enthusiastic flugelhorn player. No. Yeah, yeah. And it put Carl, <laughs> I think that's about right on the story. I mean, you can always check back. But that's the thing where it, it and, and then it, it became word of the day afterwards, I think. It did. We used it as word of the day after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's where the story originates from. But anyway, right. Yeah. So. What I'm going to do here, I'm just going to drop my gradients down and just change the relationship here. So you can see I've got these particular smart objects in here. So they're something that could change uh, very, very easily in that library. Uh, I don't actually, well, actually, I do need that background. I was going to say I don't need it. I am going to keep it. I'm going to use layer comps here. OK, in, and what I'm going to do is turn off the visibility for these layers and create a new layer comp. So a layer comp allows you to do a few things, right? So visibility, position, appearance uh, there that you can change and set it up as a, a particular view of layers. So it's, think of it as a preset for a view uh, of layers. Uh, so I'm just gonna call this one F1, right? For flugelhorn one, right? Because we're not here to see me type um, different things. I'm then going to turn that one off, turn this one on, create a new layer comp. Okay, called F2. You might notice the emerging pattern uh, just there, and then another layer comp for F3. Okay, like so. So you can see those three things. Uh -huh. yeah, and this is where you can use to switch between those layers. But if I now save this document into my Smarty Pants uh, folders, Flugelhorns, great word, isn't it, Flugelhorn? It's so good, so good. good yep. If I come back into this document and place another linked object, yeah. So I'll go ahead for my flugel horns just there, okay, and bring that in. So I should have gone bigger, but anyway, not to worry. There we are. So got that one just there. Going to place that. Going to also drag a copy down here. Should have stayed with the size I had originally. The great thing is with these, because in smart objects, Photoshop can actually access information about the layer comps. So what I could do with this one uh, here, this is the bottom one here. I could decide to change this to F2 yeah, or change it to F3 and so on. Now it's conceivable that I could have like a, let's just say I had a whole different range of flugelhorns, maybe 12 different flugelhorns. I could create the documents with those in into a library, bring them in as layers in a smart object, 
and switch between them like so, which means I don't have to keep going and interrogating the file system yeah, to get or fetching stuff from the file system yeah, to actually yeah, get access good. to those. So that's another thing where smart objects uh, are really, really useful. I'm going to yeah. use this because I'm always creating handy. enablement around different apps. And so this way I can just bring in the Illustrator logo or the Photoshop logo. Put all of the of mnemonics, them put all of the mnemonics, yeah, the logos for the products, because I mean, that we know, we understand that speak, but not everybody else does. So that's what we call the badges for icons. Put all of the mnemonics into one file. Yeah. Okay. And save layer comps for each one of those things. Then you can just switch between whatever you need. And if you need more than one, you can just drag a copy across and then just switch it to that particular um, layer comp. And InDesign can use them as well. InDesign understands yeah. layer comps, so it works for both. And it's the collaboration across our apps because at the moment I'm dragging them in. You know, like you go file, place embedded, um, yeah. and then you bring them in from a folder on your on your laptop. But this way, yeah. if they're in my Creative Cloud libraries, I can use them in XD, not just Photoshop and in InDesign, right? I can pull them into anything. You can, but yeah, you can pull those into anything. It's just that XD XD can't at the moment interrogate, can't access the smut the layer, um, comp. layer comps. Ah. Okay. Which is the thing that makes that work. But between InDesign, though, and Photoshop, amazing. Okay. Yeah. Really, really useful thing to have. It would be nice if other things do. I mean, I built uh, an email template before on a couple of occasions where I've used exactly that. And I did it at Summit um, a few years ago. Um, another way, actually, you can create smart objects uh, is in Illustrator. Yeah. So I've got this strange word just here which comes from our beloved Tim, of course, when he does his own own gigs, which is super fun. Mm -hmm. um, I can copy that out of here, go back to Photoshop and paste that in, and I get the choice there to bring it in as a smart object. Yeah. So if I go ahead and do that, now I can do whatever I need to do to this. So if I want to add layer styles to it, for example, I can do that. So I think we should, I think we're kind of obliged uh, to do that, so I'll do a color overlay uh, just here, set the color mode to normal, not green, perhaps. I don't know. Is that one of your favorite colors, Tim? Whisper in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, it is. so I can do all of that. Here's the great thing that I, well, I think it's a great thing. I am actually going to close that document and I'm going to click don't save. So now that's gone, right? That file has gone. Yeah. However, because it's become, it's an it's a smart object in here, but it's been bought into, it's been created by this file. It actually still lives on, because if I double click on it in this layer, you'll see it now opens up as a separate document in Illustrator called Vector Smart Object. That's and I use that like a lot uh, when i'm making thumbnails for my own youtube channel i've got uh, an illustrator file which is actually a linked object but it's that same kind of thing um and i've got all of the different color backgrounds that i use in there so if i'm doing something on photoshop it's blue for example and orange for illustrator and all of that stuff yeah. and so i can just jump out of photoshop change that in there and yeah. done really easy i think uh, so yeah and Tim do a um a live um, Adobe Live on thumbnails for the, the Adobe Live shows. Didn't you do one like that? Tim did, yes, I think. Yes, yes, I did. He did. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone else hear that, or is that just Tony? Yes. I think it's. Okay, oh, no, I think everybody did hear it. Okay, that's cool. But <laughs> it's kept that information in there, which is super, super handy mm. that it can do that. You know, especially if I went, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to delete that file. I can just go to the smart object here. Get that, copy it, close it, create a new document, yeah, paste it in, saved. Because all of that geometry is still in there. Okay. Yeah. So it's very, very useful uh, for that. I'm going to make something around Timistified at some point. Anyway, back to the other various kinds of smart object tricks. It's time we did something, um, something cool with the smart objects. So I love Adobe Camera Raw. In fact, I think on my first ever uh, Adobe Live on the sofa, as it was then, I think I did a thing 
that in, that had camera raw in it. I think whenever I've done a Photoshop thing, I've done camera raw in that as well. Um, and so I'm going to use that just here. I'm going to use the camera raw uh, filter on there. So if I've got access to that, uh, interestingly enough, that wasn't launching via the shortcut. Why is that? Do you know why? Why? Because this document's in CMYK. Mm. Doesn't work in CMYK. So let's create a new file just here. Doo -doo. And then we'll bring that in from here and we'll resize it. How do you resize stuff, Mads? Well, do you know, I remember when they did the update where they linked, uh, you know, at the very top with the width and the height. Yeah. And so I used to go in there before, I used to click link, and then I would expand or, you know, so that used yeah. to be the, you know, the, the main way. Um, I, like, I like to use stapler accident finger. How did you quick. activate that? So I know that Jackie in the chat asked how you did that earlier. Ah. That? Right. So stapler accident finger. Hopefully, I don't know if you can see my screen zooming, but hopefully you can. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. This small icon just here, that's what I call stapler accent finger. Whenever you, whenever you see it, those arrows, okay, are the indicators for which directions you can drag in. And you can change most things by doing that. So all I'm doing here is going over the width field and dragging them because they're linked. Yeah. Yeah. Then they'll stay the same together. See, that's good. See, I was doing it right then. This is so good. I'm getting reassurance now. I'm like, yes, Maddie. You're doing it right. You're not um, clicking on the wrong thing or dragging it. I can't stand it when people resize shapes by by just pulling the width or just and everything distorts and you yeah. can see it so clearly as well. And you're yeah. Like, why? Why? So. Oh, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Right. I'm just going to tap F on my keyboard here to go full screen with uh, Adobe Camera Raw and mm -hmm. Command Zero, Control Zero to zoom in. There's the thing with temperature and tint. So. These are the opposite way around for LAB, but they're essentially the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So, and thanks, Tim, for, for pulling me up on that one. That's really good. So I might want to do some things here, such as make this. This is something with Sarah Coleman would be a good one to do this. Right? To make something dark. She like does like a bit of dark. Sarah Coleman. Cool. Inky Moore. I can bring the highlights down. So I'm purposely making this very, very, very dark. I'm ho hopefully not peeking out on your screen, so you're just seeing a black rectangle. Um, but anyway, that'll dark. do for now. Sorry, say again. Oh, no, I was going to say, it's not too dark, but Sean asks a very good question here. Why are you using Adobe Camera Raw and not Lightroom? Because I'm using it as a filter. Uh -huh. So okay. here it's a filter, it's not Camera Raw. It is the Camera Raw engine, but yeah. you'll notice it's a filter Okay, on this particular layer. So if I just wanted to edit an image as is, then the chances are I would use Lightroom or I would use the Camera Raw interpreter. So when you bring in a raw file or a JPEG or a TIFF file um, from Bridge, you can use the Camera Raw interpreter. So that takes the information. In fact, let's not overcomplicate it with the J JPEG and TIFF thing. Let's just keep it with a raw file. Yeah. You need an interpreter because you can't damage a raw file. It's like your your own digital neg, apart from by dumping it in the trash. You can't, you're only ever interpreting it. Um, so if you use the interpreter, that's what most people refer to as camera raw. But it's super, super powerful and it can do loads of things that aren't very easy to do uh, in Photoshop alone. And the Lightroom uh, Lightroom uses the uh, Adobe Camera Raw engine as well, right? So it, it's there. It's just Lightroom is separately purposed uh, for that, but it exists in one and in the other. Uh, here, it's as a filter. It actually lives here in the filter menu. Okay, just here, there you go, Camera Raw filter, and you can apply it to a layer or a portion of a layer. Yeah, and shortly, I'll be showing you where, uh, where that can be really, really handy as mm. well. OK, so here, if I wanted to do something like uh, take this daytime image, um, in fact, do you know, I'm going to work on that just a little bit more just here. I'm just going to go back into I've just double clicked. Let me cancel out of that um, just a second. I've just double clicked on the words camera raw filter just there yeah. Okay, to take me back into the camera raw filter. And I'm just going to add a local uh, adjustment just here. So I'm going to add a radial adjustment in the back here. 
like that just there. Uh, and what I'm going to do uh, is go ahead and reset the settings for that and then take this one right the way down like that just to darken up that path at the back. Okay, there we and go. You, you would use this um, if you were doing not just photography like this, right? That these these types of images. Would you use this um, for uh, product images, for example? Like, would I mean, you, you could. Well, yeah, you could do. Would it be for could that? Do. Mm. Yeah, you could do. I mean, it it can be used on anything. That's the thing. It's it's mm. it can be used on anything. I mean, I use it a lot in compositing. Um, but yeah, you can use it on it. It just it gives you. You can perform a whole load of edits in just one place with the smart object. If you've got it wrapped as a smart object and you're using the camera raw filter, there's a lot you can do without damaging the original product photo or the original photo. Mm. Yeah. So if you wanted to try some experimental stuff to run past the customer and you didn't want to introduce tons of layers, tons of work, smart object is definitely the route to go down. Yeah, and then Good use the effect. camera raw filter on it to extrude it. I'm going to show you a trick actually shortly involving a kitten. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that in that gallery. I yeah, it's in, the, it's in that gallery. Yeah, it is in that <laughs> library. Absolutely. Uh, involving a kitten um, uh, that is very useful. And in fact, I use this. I had a whole load, 120 images to process last week uh, for something I was working on. And uh, some of them needed cutting out. Uh, and select subject just wasn't working for some of them because a few of them were wearing um, helmets that were white and they'd been shot against a white background. Oh, no. Yeah. And so they were tricky, yeah. But I just thought, mm, I can get around that. So I brought them in as smart objects into a file, yeah. Ran a trick with Camera Raw, yeah. And then managed to, to pull them from the image more successfully. Worked pretty well, actually. Uh, here I've got an option. I can show the mask, right? So this is what's being created by this radial filter. And you can actually erase from that. I've got some tools just at the top here, right? It switches to radial filter whenever you've got one. And I've got this eraser just here i can change the brush and the feathering and all of that stuff mm -hmm. uh, from there you can still use your keys as well because i don't want this effect i want the radial effect but i just don't want it in a couple of areas mm -hmm. just there I'm gonna, so i'm just going to paint those bits out like so okay i'll turn the mask off right and you can see that now it's not touching the sides of the bridge there but that's a couple of different adjustments in one place and what i can also do here right is i can go ahead i've got a mask just down here now the mask is for the smart filters turn it off turn it back on again mm -hmm. so off and on again so you've got an instant before and after i could then get my brush tool uh for example if i work on the mask uh, just here let's make this uh, a bit bigger and soft so let's go like that I love changing my brush size like this, by the way. It's so much better than... Mm, it is good. Messing around. Yeah, because I can change the, the hardness of the brush as well. In fact, that's just a bit too big. But if I wanted to just bring in some light into this area here, mm -hmm. right, then I can paint with black, which is... Let me just do that really crudely. Yeah, can you see that? Uh -huh. So this time, I'm going to do it, um, but a bit softer. So I'm just going to tap three on my keyboard to change the opacity to 30 percent and i will make that a bit bigger and now start to hmm, i've got pressure on somewhere there we go you see that i could just yeah. introduce light to this and make it look as if it was being lit by another light source i'm not trying to do a perfect job here just in case you're wondering but the pen tool, though, that's what this is. What's great about Photoshop, though, right? Because this is um, if I used to do the old school technique of of doing a new sky before they gave the update that came at Max last year. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, if I would sit that's for that's ages, cool. zooming in with the pen tool, coloring in trees to bring them back after bringing in a sky, and now it's like much easier. It um, is much easier. Since they did the update, but yeah, that, yeah, that's one of the things that people want to be able to do, right? Is change uh, change a sky. Yeah quickly yeah so i'm just making that softer now in a couple of places just to bring that in but if i wanted to suggest that this was being lit uh from somewhere else and i could bring in my own light source from here and i could dab a few of those bits in in other places where the light might catch so just imagine it was being lit by a flashlight 
then you might actually bring in these bits here. They might be being illuminated at the same time. It'd be almost impossible for them not to. Mm. Can you see that? Yeah. Just at that opacity as I brush over that. So it would probably catch more on this edge. Yeah, so I could go and introduce mm -hmm. bits and it might to for the unevenness of that stone, it might be worth dabbing these things yeah. in. Do you know it's something I'd love to do at some point is is to do a a whole live just doing this stuff. Should do it really. Don't yeah, have to do it here. Should. I can do it on my own thing. Just hit the microphone. There you go. Good. Um, did you get a nice dump? <laughs> <laughs> we did, we did. Hey, um, there's been a lot of chat about our Discord group. Uh, I know that Tim yep. has posted the link uh, a couple of times, but for anybody that's watching today, um, the chat will always continue on Discord, and it's a really great place for us all to share work, to keep the conversation going. Um, so I know that Tim's just posted it again in the chat there. Uh, so Damien, I can see some questions from you in there today about Discord. Get in there. You can chat to us all. And the team, uh, you know, the community we have in Discord, they're great. They'll all help you um, give tips. Everyone really helps each other, which is what's so great about it. So join us in there. Oh, there's the cat. Look at this. So cute. So, so okay. cute. Again, coming in as a smart object. Remember, smart objects are the core that, that I'm, I'm driving at here uh, today yeah. and why they're so super useful. Uh, so I've got this. Let's pretend that this kit. Now let's see it actually. Let's put it to the test first. Let's see how select subject, yeah, deals with that kitten. It's it's actually pretty good. Pretty good. Just a bit by the paw that's missing in the middle. But other than yeah, that, it's just a bit there. That's amazing. that's right. So I've just gone. I've just tapped Q to go into quick mask mode. I was going to tap Q again to exit it and deselect that. Let's pretend it wasn't being uh, so helpful. What I'm going to do is with that layer selected, I'm going to use the shortcut shift command A to get to the camera raw filter. And then I'm going to make it light loads more contrasty and also loads more dark. Yeah, so I'm going to bring the shadows down. The shadows would only be apparent in the cat and the blacks down like so. Yeah, so bring those things right the way down like that. It might even get, well, I'm not going to get much more contrast out of that. I could try boosting the highlights, but let's see if that would impact. Yeah, something like that. You could also run something like dehaze on it, which would make it, that's that's a great way of changing uh, different levels of contrast. Yeah. So I'll do that and hit OK. Yeah. Do, do, and hit OK. <laughs> <laughs> and hit OK. <laughs> what you can't see is that my butler sat right here next to me and his white glove just comes over and clicks okay for me yeah and you're fired jeeves <laughs> go away be gone and, uh, i'll have the groundsman shoot you right so <laughs> if i try that again now select subject just here now let's tap q it's got it yeah it's got it. Not only that, it's actually removed some of the shadow down there as well. So it's made an improvement in that selection. Now, once, now I've got the selection, I can just drag the camera roll filter away and carry on working with that. See, that is, do you know, that is so good because mm. there's often, I, I find that I have this problem, right? And I design a lot of slides. Um, so I'm, I'm working a lot in PowerPoint, but I'm building things sometimes in Power, um, in Photoshop and I'm bringing it in. And um, in Photoshop, um, not Photoshop, yeah. in PowerPoint, there's a feature where you can click on an image to bring something in and you click um, set transparent color. So it's like a, it's like a smart object. It will search yeah. for it the image in, in PowerPoint, and it never does a, a really good job of getting you know it clear, especially if you're on a, di a darker background. Yeah. So um, this is so fast, just making sure that you can, you know, darken the image, you you know, cut it out as a smart object, and then, see, this is going to save me time. Have you integrated um, your Creative Cloud libraries with PowerPoint and Word? I have, and I also yeah. have integrated Adobe Stock into PowerPoint as well. Mm. So I'm in, I'm in Adobe Stock all the time, um, living in there, especially with Mogart files at the moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mogart. Yes. It's all good that they it's all integrated because it's, it's much faster, for sure. It certainly is. Uh, I've just dropped into the Select and Mask workspace just here, and what I'm going to do is just pop around uh, a few bits of this. Are there any questions from the chat, Mads? Have we got any, um, any cues? A little um, chat around um, Discord. 
So we mentioned yeah. Discord. And uh, I don't think that there's a lot of questions. Um, oh, I know that good. Sandrine is offering Stuart some help uh, to carry on some other questions and things in Discord, which is lovely. Thanks for helping everyone out, everybody. Um, I've just mullered that. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> you carry on. I'm having a look in the chat. Um, I'm yeah, mullering. Yeah, no. And I think it's just, you know, Adobe Sensei is, is really what's come up. And just the things that this can do, um, Adobe Sensei and the magic, really, that it can see, you know, things that it can do. I don't think you ever listened to my podcast when it was running. Um, but we used yeah. to have Adobe Sensei in it every now and then. But Adobe Sensei was actually the HAL 2000 or HAL 9000 computer from from uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. You'd, every now and then, just it was me and my mate Dave talking, yeah. and every now and then you'd, you'd have this voice going, you don't want to do that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going, oh no, it's Sensei again. From, uh, <laughs> from there, you keep, we keep threatening to, um, to do that again, but I, I don't think it's going to ever happen. I that think it's fun. It's good, but we got you on Adobe Live now. And so this yeah. is where you belong. This is where you need to be. And it Oliver's is. mentioned, um, I'm curious of what a, a PowerPoint presentation looks like color-wise, but I have produced. Do you know, yes, there have been some dodgy ones, Oliver. I'm not going to lie, right? But, it's, <laughs> but um, no, mostly, mostly good because I'm under strict guidelines of templates. So it's, it's good. <laughs> oh. Oh yeah, that's what oh, that's that. just what this image needed was a giant kitten. It did. With lasers through the eyes, I think someone mentioned. We've done that already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did you do did. that with the gift. Sure yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't do that. I remember I remember that. <laughs> but yeah, you can you can you can see that 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 because you can combine uh, masking with smart objects, there's no reason for you not to not to not to play with them and and uh, and mm. use them in your workflow um it, so handy to do but that trick for for using camera raw the camera raw filter with um with a, a, a smart object to, to make it easier to actually extract yeah uh, that information so good so so good i can't take completely the credit well i can take the credit for doing that in camera raw to start off with but before that matt glaskowski uh he used to do a thing with with um with smart objects and darkening them yeah um, in that way but he used a slightly different method i think um but yeah no really really good we're not really gonna have that kitten in this image i think that would be very poor uh, indeed so let's try uh, fixing a couple of other things uh, with a smart object. What else did I put in my library? I oh, know that was pretty much those things in the library. So we can build something out of here. Give me a, a thing, Mads. A thing? That should be in this image. Um, ooh, I would say um, you need like a dark character or something yeah. that looks like something, you know, like red, almost like Red Riding Hood going through the bridge into the forest or, you know. Something like that. Actually, I'll search this on Adobe Stock before I'm surprised by the results. <laughs> Hobbit. <laughs> Hobbit. <laughs> yeah. Let's go with... Oh, Scott put Snape. Yes, a Harry Potter reference. Loving a bit of Harry Potter. Do there we go. Yes. Tim loves Harry Potter as well. And um, when people are allowed to travel um, backwards and forwards, like anywhere, Lord knows when, um, but when uh, when they are allowed to travel backwards and forwards, I've promised our Tim uh, that I will take him to Harry Potter World. Yes. Um, along with my daughter, Chloe, who has been there, I think, nine times. Yeah. <gasps> she, really? she knows that universe backwards. She really does. Uh, to do that oh. so i'm going to extract this now so again i might just change the so this thing. time i'm lifting the exposure just okay. here yeah and uh -huh. giving can you say i'm working on the shadows and then the blacks here because it will make it easier for sensei yeah. uh, to work so let's give that a go select subject no, it's not too bad actually i'm going to tap no, q not. this is the way i kind of evaluate it yeah I kind of evaluate it by using quick mask if the color by the way so red perhaps not the best color 
Yeah. Um, I can always go ahead, double click on that and change it to what we now call Maddie Green. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like that. And now we can check it uh, that way. Yeah, that's what this is a masterclass, you see. So you see these, <laughs> that's why you see these things and you and you hear these strange technical terms like Maddie Green. Change your quick mask to Maddie Green. Yeah, there's, there's uh, Factor Red and Maddie Green. I mean, they, <laughs> I do need my Maddie own Magenta. <gasps> see? There you oh. go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cerise, definitely for you, lovey. <laughs> right, so you can see there that I've used that so that I can evaluate that. So I've used Camera Raw to, to yeah. modify it uh, so that I can get uh, a, a lift yeah, from it there. And also, right, so that uh, I can just check the edges. I reckon that is it's not bad, you know. There's one tiny bit just in there. Now, I don't yeah. even have to leave anywhere else to do that because quick mask mode, um, actually allows you to paint in it as well. So I could switch to my brush just here, okay? And actually, I'm going to do it that way because I need a hard brush on there. Or s almost, about 90% hardness. And bring that down. And I'm going to change my opacity back to zero. So there's a few little bits in there. And paint the black. So you can see that? I mean, quick masking. Really good. It was, it was one of the first ways of actually doing this, you know, mm. doing this quickly. I mean, the other masks were there, but it was a very quick way of creating a selection. You can hear birds in your garden, Tony. Yeah, there's loads out there. That's nice. It is nice. Gareth's mentioned that he's not heard the puppy today. No, Elvis is, has gone out for a walk. Elvis has left the building. Elvis has um, gone to live on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, no puppy, not his allowed that puppy, I tell you. He's getting big. He's huge. He's three times the size of, uh, he's seven months old now, everybody. I have a puppy called Elvis. He's a beagle. And uh, he's mischief, pure mischief. No. Mischief personified. He is. Oh, Buddy, Buddy, who is the newest dog we've got. He's been with us a couple of years. He's very cute. Mm. Um, he uh, he's a miniature Dachshund, so he's he's kind of as big as he's as he's going to get. I didn't know that he was. I, yeah, because he's tiny. Yeah, he's a miniature, so he's only about oh. uh, about that long. Yeah, something like that. Very but sweet. Just <laughs> that much neck. The rest yep. of the <laughs> body that long. It's kind of cool. Mm. They, uh, Hey, if anyone's got any tips in the chat for how to keep a dog completely still so that you can get a good photograph, um, let me know. Uh, I'm doing everything, treats, um, <laughs> anything. So I'm sure that people, we must have photographers here that are great at doing this. You so the nice thing is easy. here, by the way, is that I'm, I'm just using layers to do this, right? So it's... Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just using the one layer to do all of this stuff in. And um, back when back when we worked together, worked together when I was at Adobe, that mm. was that was kind of my like downtime thing. If I had, if I ever, well, you don't get that much downtime at Adobe, do you? Really, to be honest. But on the times where you do get downtime, the rare occasions, that's what I used to set myself a challenge: Can I do this in just one single layer? Can I make a particular thing happen without introducing other layers? Not that there's anything wrong with layers, but I just wanted to see yeah. how far using this, what using smart want? objects and these things, how far you could actually go with it. Yeah. And the answer I found is actually quite a long way, you know, quite a long way. So I'm just yeah. going to do that. Now I'm going to add uh, a layer mask. Of course, the uh, the light direction there. Uh, well, I've just made it with my torch. So <laughs> I can easily change that if I want to. Uh, so yeah. at the moment, uh, not exactly where I want it to be. Uh, da -da. Oh, yes, I am. Tim put um, <laughs> in the chat all the single layers, all the single layers. <laughs> Tim, man, you are so good. He is. You really he? are so so Tim. good. You are amazing. He is amazing. 
fantastic. Right, so uh, I could get rid of that camera raw filter, but I think what I'm going to do instead is go back into it uh, and then just, I think perhaps uh, just reset that to the default settings just there because the color's not actually too bad. Yet something else we could use here, you know, as well, if we wanted to, is neural filters. So if we do that, let's have a oh, look yeah. and see what neural filters. And again, this is something that's being added on top. Yeah or should be added on top of that. So let's just go for... Uh, We've had a good play with these neural filters when they launched back in um, in October. I did the yeah, kids. Yeah, they are pretty um, good. You can age, you know, you can add, uh, you know, so it made me look like an old lady. And it's so accurate. So... I, I had one that made me look like an old man and it's stuck. Look, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> Only 28. <laughs> Uh, where's the thing I'm after? I'm after the actual light direction thing. There is a light direction thing. Only works when it sees a face. Oh, no. Tim's just helped me out there. Oh, I was just thinking that might have helped on that particular thing. But here, again, because I've got that stuff, I know there should be some shadow in here. So I could actually brush in an adjustment. Now, what I tend to do is make a big brush stroke like so. Yeah. And uh, then zoom in on that area. Weird stuff going on there. So let's just zoom in. Do, do, do. Very cool. Yeah, I'll make a big, and I don't need to be careful here either because it's going to be clipped by the layer mask. So I've just made that darker. Now I could test that out and see if that needs to be. And actually, because it would be fairly dark, and I can be. add to that really easily just here so let's just go ahead and switch that back to there and add a bit more in weirdness let's try that out hey yeah, see that's kind of getting there okay again back in and then just carry on with that adjustment. Now, the great thing is all I need to do is select that tool and then click on that adjustment to activate it. And then I can carry on painting in that area. Yeah. So because that's what makes it active. And if I want to add a new one, I could do that. And if I add, add another one just over here, for example, I could do that as well. Let me just say OK to that. You see, that works, works pretty well. Yeah. And... I also know that I need a shadow underneath there. Now, for that, I'd need to go back into this one here, get another radial adjustment, yeah, and drop that. Let's just do that just down there, move that into place. Let's make that nice and soft. There we go, like so. Okay, now again, you tune all of these things, so I'm just changing the exposure there slightly. And moment, oh, I've masked it out actually just at the moment. So I'd have to actually reintroduce that on the mask. So I'd need to paint here with white. Okay, let's get a nice big chunky brush for that and super soft. Shows though, like I think you started editing this part of the image. Um, not even, I mean, it was yeah. I don't know, about 1 p.m. It's like quarter past now and you've already done so much. And it and yeah, the picture's mad. already transformed. It, it's it's fast, really. But yeah, that so that's you could. I mean, there's a bit of turn and frame between the two things. Ultimately, if it was if if I thought that that mask, I wanted to keep that, right? But I wanted to be able to introduce the shadow underneath. I could actually mm. mask that bit away in a separate thing. You can always create a smart object as another smart object. So you don't just have to have it as one thing. You can always yeah. convert it. A second time so you can nest them together that's why yeah. they're so cool that you can bring those things in let hey, me just um, do uh the next if it's quarter past scott does have a question for you he asked what yeah. was the shortcut for the um ellipsical shadow uh that you just did which is on the floor of the image oh for the radial uh-huh what was that shortcut? i think it's r uh let me go back and double check for you, hold on, I can just hover over it and it'll tell me it's J. There you go. J. 
J mm -hmm. to get to the local local adjustments uh, just there. But it may be that I'd introduce separate things to, to change that out. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I'm not trying to produce a perfect uh, piece just there. So let me try something else with uh, with a smart object. So if I bring in this kitten just here. Oh, in fact, you know what? I need a new kitten. Hold on. I'm going to just get myself a new kitten from Adobe Stock. I'm not showing you my searches because I'm just trying to find some. Oh, that one's so good. Hold on. <laughs> So how come you're not searching Adobe Stock in the Photoshop app? Because you can have that in your search, right? I, can, I could do that. that in the, yeah, I could do that in the library. I could do that just here Yeah. in the library. I could have done that at the top here. In fact, let's search for another one. Actually, j just so we don't upset um, dog people, I yeah. might have both, so I'm not too worried. But just so we, oh. <laughs> just so we don't upset the dog people, <laughs> look at that that that's a perfect i'm going to license that one very cute. just here the actually do you know what i'm not going to license it i'm going to add it to this library because this is another um i missed that actually at the beginning this is another benefit of the whole smart object thing let's just say i was going to produce something for a client right or for a particular job let uh -huh. me just uh, i'm just going to hold down the command key click on that thumbnail to select it and then crop that image to that size right um let's just say i wanted to i've been given a brief to do something yeah and i wasn't i wasn't you know you don't want to bother your client all the time and go is this image okay is this image okay is this image? Mm. you know all of that stuff what you want to do is you want to get something together show it to them and if they go like mm, no yeah then you don't want to license it if you, you don't want to license it absolutely no. and and you know you and you also don't want to do something that involves you making loads of layers. There's nothing wrong with layers, but making them unnecessarily is, is silly, right? So what I could do here is I could go ahead and go to my filters. I'm going to come down to blur. I'm going to choose Gaussian blur because it's a smart object. I can go as nuts as I want here. Yeah. So let's do 42, which of course is the answer to everything. I like where this is going, but let's just start over. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Make it more interactive. This looks like a short list. <laughs> anyway, right, hovering art director Jewel. Uh, right, so I can do that, but of course, if I change my mind, all I need to do is double click here, right, and then just bring that down to whatever I want it to be, just there. Right. So that's another great thing with using smart objects. If you're not sure where you're going to go with a particular filter, yeah, then apply them on top of the smart object mm -hmm. in that way. Right. So I've got that. Another thing is I can blend this differently here. OK, so what I can do is go ahead and choose. Let's choose maybe yeah, divide. I think it would be good for that. Yeah, so you can see that I've changed the look here. Yeah. Right. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to use some camera raw filter on that. Okay. And I'm going to change the profile here to monochrome. There we go. And just have a quick look at the black and white things. I'm just going to hold, I love the fact that I can just scroll over these results and they apply yeah. that quickly. That's pretty good actually. Being being right, WO6 is good. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to go with uh, this profile 06, just there, okay, and back. And then, of course, I can still continue tuning this, so I can change the exposure here, make it a tad more contrasty, mm -hmm. let's bring down some of the deepest colours there and the shadows, like that. There you go. And so maybe my client has asked me for... Uh, something that looks vaguely pencil sketch like there's, there's another way that I can do this that's that's much more involved um, in fact it's called the TDM technique the design ninja technique uh, ah. for doing it because uh, I made it there you go but if I want to do something like that and they said mm, uh, no. yeah 
uh, I, I don't like corgis. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I'd use layers to do that, I would have to, uh, I'd have to make a whole load of changes. But here, if I just search again for, pup oh, look at that. You can yeah. see, well, that's a premium image. It looks like Elvis when he was new. Mm. Yeah, very, very similar. So let's go for another puppy. That looks like our Jessie when she was a puppy. Uh, let's go with, I'm, I'm busy, I'm busying myself. <laughs> it's another corgi. I'm busying myself with, with the puppy selection just here. Strange, there's a lot of corgis in there. Uh, I'm also trying to pick a good candidate image for this. Oh, look at that. Sandrine asks, can we have a Great Dane? We could try searching for one. Uh, Let's see if we can see Great Dane Puppy. Great Dane Puppy. And was anybody at Adobe Max, I think it was three years ago, when they we had a puppy pit right in the centre yeah. of the pavilion, and they brought puppies in for everyone just to cuddle and play with in the middle of the day. Haven't um, I got video of you in that? Didn't you get me to video you while you were in it? I'm sure I have. Yeah. I had to was make I a stalking you? I don't know. Real. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were with me. We were queuing up for pup to see the puppies. And um, yeah. I had to, my job there was to make a video, like a max highlight reel for everyone internally at Adobe. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and we got it, me, and this dog was licking my face. And I'm not a fan of that. And so I was like, uh, about this. Um, but yes, it was a yeah, good, good idea. Whoever's idea that was to bring puppies to Adobe Max was amazing. The puppy pit it was one of those things for the experience wasn't it with the experience yeah. of of just having you know so what i'm going to do here is i am going to right click on this smart objects and i'm going to choose to relink to a library graphic mm -hmm. okay so i need to then select my graphic which is going to be the great dane and choose relink and you can see how that updates instantly yeah and if they said, yes, that's exactly what I was looking for. I could just go ahead and license that directly here inside application. Of course, you don't have to use library graphics. If you were, you know, you could also go ahead and relink to a file from there as well. So it's just libraries nice and convenient for that if you're in a collaborative workflow. But if it's on your own system and you're just trying to try out different things, you can go ahead and choose, you know, files as well. So. It doesn't matter as long yeah. as it's a smart object, it will just replace it with with that stuff, which is super, super good. Um, and you can also, if I get, uh, let's just mess around with this a little bit. I'm going to just undo and go back to the Corgi because uh, I think it's a good candidate. I'm going to go for my brush here. Let's try and find uh, a kind of scratchy brush. Carl makes so many brushes. I'm glad they finally introduced a search field in there because mm. it's um in fact let me just see if i've got um no it's a what is a currency brush wow, wow. Tim's just said yeah. that there's over 1800 brushes oh, amazing i asked dan mumford yeah um once i said how many brush what brushes do you use how many brushes do you use i'm always in interested in that and i asked sam gilby the same thing both of you in the show sam uses a few from uh kyle's brushes um dan one really he gets everything he needs done with just the one brush and which is that brush which one does he use i think it's the, the default um soft round no way. I'm liking yeah. the dark old brush. It's his thing. birthday on Friday. Happy birthday for Friday. Yes, ha happy birthdays, Dan. Uh, I'm going to choose this crackle brush. Let's see how this works out. Of course, I need to paint on the mask. And I need to paint on the mask with black. Let's give this a go. Just here. Oh, that's too big. But you can get some great effects this way. You can kind of introduce... So if you wanted that sort of atmospheric effect, you could go ahead and just add some nice. selective color. I normally do this with a brush that I don't have loaded on this system. Um, one of the ones from Aaron Blaze, he does a hair brush, um, hair and fur brush, and he's got one that's got tight curls. 
And I do that at a low opacity because that's the other thing that works really well on a mask like this. I was doing that at hundred percent, but if I did that at something like 20% here and selectively introduce, so I'm going to make that larger now, just so we're not here all day. Okay. But if I do it now at a low opacity, you can start introducing some color like so. But the important thing here is kids, it's on one layer. Yeah, so all of this is occurring just in one place. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, just by dabbing that up. I've got five stabs at it to make it uh, make it up to 100% opacity. So you've got loads. I don't know why I'm just yeah. working in the middle of the screen like that. There we go. You see that? Yeah. And that's it just restoring good. the original photo. But it's a really nice effect to uh -oh. have. Does our gang like that? That's what I want to know. Yes. I mean, there's there's been a few comments. Um, I think at the moment, Jackie is worried that our house has gone strangely quiet. And normally in my house, quiet means mischief. I would, be, I would be afraid, very afraid. But um, Kirsty's saying make the most of it. Yes. Kirsty, I, Absolutely. I, I would as well. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, yes. You've shown so many different shortcuts and things today. And I'm going to have to watch back to how you were talking about color overlay, because that's um, something that I need to, to change my, my process for that. So I'm going to take that from today. And I'm also going to take the tip that you gave me about using the layers uh, for the text instead of keeping clicking on the text uh, tool on the left. So I'm actually yeah, going to use my layers. Yeah, just double click the T. Tool. Yeah, that's the, yeah. That's, the, that's the quick way to do it. I'm yeah. going to do that. That's one another thing. And then this last part that you've just shown here, because yeah. um, you're right in that when you're developing assets and, and images or whatever, for me, for slides, um, often they're not. We'll send slides back to our presenters and they'll say, no, I don't like that slide. Can you find something that's, uh, you know, more black and white or you know, less yeah. colour, Maddie? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Strange that. Who, who knew? I who know. knew? <laughs> And so now, you know, so I can I can apply the same um, effects through smart objects like you've shown me. Uh, so that will save me some time. So thank you. For That's all right. I'm not quite time. done. I can do a few more things. I think we've got a few more minutes, actually, two or three minutes. With three minutes. So, and Angus says he's learnt lots today as well. That's cool. Yeah. Good. The uh, I'm just going to bring in uh, something that is approaching Maddie level colour, oh, no. I think. It's great just being able to pull this stuff in uh, like so. There's a team working behind me furiously to make all of this stuff good. Uh, there you go. That's, that's your sort of thing. Again, I think that the marriage of, of smart objects and the camera raw filter is so, so powerful. So powerful. If I wanted to tone this image differently, I could bring in the camera raw filter here. Now there's tons and tons, apart from the basic adjustments, there are things such as color grading, which used to be, I mean, that's come, that's sort of midway between the video world and, and the photography world, color grading. But this used to be called cross process. Um, uh, all the effects I'm gonna do is a cross process from which you could select to adjust the shadows, midtones, and highlights Okay, so if I went for my shadows here, I could say that I want my shadows to be, you know, kind of purplish color. Yeah, and you can see that occurring in the back mm -hmm. uh, just there. And I want my mid-tones. I'm going to try and keep the mid-tones and, um, and the highlights together, really. But I could do that and then go for the highlights right in the same sort of region. You can see how you can create these fab yeah. cross-process looks. There's our friend Luminance again just there as well, by the way. Mm. So... Do all of that in one place. There's nothing to stop you from also combining that with monochrome. So if you want to do a quick sepia hit on there, you can see that I managed to do that. And it's all 100% editable. It's, it's completely non-destructive. Yeah. Uh, and I can even do before and after quite easily if I just get my lasso tool here. Okay, and I'm going to go just outside the image, hold down the option key here and so I can quickly do polygonal stuff. Focus on the mask, fill that with black. You know, all of that good stuff, which is kind of handy. It looks so good. It's, it's good um, fun. It's smart objects, yeah. They're things that we should use more. 
definitely. It's good to see them used in so many different examples today. Mm. And you can combine, as you saw with the blur thing and the um, uh, in the kitten image. Mm. Have I still got that active? Yeah, you can see camera raw and Gaussian blur there. So again, I could just double click on that to tune it. Yeah, if I decided that was not in, or too much, you can see how that changes just there if it was like not enough. And then it re-renders the effects on the top. Yeah. And it was a good um, tip that you gave about uh, recolouring images so that you can use the smart object filter easier. Yeah. Sometimes you can't cut out as easy. So, yes, that's a, another yeah. good tip. Well, um, it's half past one, Tony. Our masterclass has been 90 minutes and we've definitely learned a lot thank you to everybody that's um you know been with us on this yes. journey today the chat will continue in discord and we will be back for another adobe live on friday we've got bert muskerton here um i think it's changing faces i think there's something going on there so definitely join because it does sound like a really great session and have um, a little bit of a look at bert beforehand yeah. people who are coming take a look at his stuff so take a look at his skateboards he's just produced a range of skateboards uh he's got a last supper thing on that's that's fantastic he's just brilliant fab well join us again and we'll see you all soon thank you everybody goodbye bye We'll